At 11.40 p.m. shipboard time on April 14th, 1912, the Titanic barely avoided a full-on collision with an iceberg, instead striking a glancing blow against that iceberg. They were how about halfway across the Atlantic in their maiden journey from Liverpool to the United States to New York City, and they were far away from rescue. They didn't know exactly what had happened yet, so Captain Smith went down, went up to the bridge, figured out that they'd hit, into a, hit an iceberg, and he went and he roused Thomas Andrews, the architect of the Titanic. They went downstairs to try and ascertain the damage. It would take them some time to figure this out, but six of the 16 compartments in the Titanic had been punctured by this. Men had already died, but more were just working to try to stem the floodwaters. The Titanic could take a pretty massive blow. It was the greatest thing we'd ever built. It was a triumph of technology. This was at the end of a century of unending Western progress, particularly in Europe. Other than their civil war, the countries had stopped fighting each other. There was peace. There was scientism. There were new discoveries. They believed in themselves, and they were prideful. The Titanic was the ultimate symbol. It was the unsinkable ship. 25 minutes later, at 12.05 shipboard time, which is not too far from the Eastern Standard, Captain Smith gave the order to bring all the crew above deck, to bring all the guests above deck, all the passengers, and to ready the lifeboats. Now, there's some misconceptions about the Titanic, that they intentionally didn't have enough lifeboats, that, that this was some kind of a cheap move. It wasn't a cheap move. They didn't want to obscure the views off the deck. They had as many as were required, and the lifeboats were designed to bring you to another ship, not to go into 28-degree water for hours of darkness and hold everyone there. It would be another 20 minutes before Thomas Andrews came back up and informed Captain Smith that the unsinkable ship was going down. He took charge of the evacuation and tried as best he could. A lot of things were playing against the people on the Titanic, but out of this, we get a lot of human stories, which is why I want to talk to you about today, because this is not just a history lesson. This is, this is something that we need to draw on. The decisions that were made on that deck that night are decisions that hopefully we'll never have to make, but in smaller levels at some point in our lives, and someday later when facing death, these decisions will come up. And these men, some of them cowards and, and, and villains, and other ones, heroes and absolute gentlemen and gentle ladies stand out through time and may seem like a distant thing for us, but they have a lot of meaning. After the ship struck that iceberg, they only had 100 minutes before that ship was gone. This was a massive endeavor, and they had never even done an evacuation. The lifeboat drill that was supposed to happen the previous Sunday had been canceled. A lot of the people who were in steerage one had less people to go down there and talk to them. They had less stewards to handle them. Most first-class cabins had their own. Uh, but they were further away. They were further removed. And because of U.S. immigration law, not because of some awful bigotry, they were locked away. They were kept separate. They had to go through a separate immigration port. Most of these people didn't speak English. They were not first-class Americans and Englishmen returning lords and this and that. They were people who were coming here to start a new life and go through Ellis Island. They had to go through disease checks. So they were completely separate. There was no shipwide intercom. They couldn't just put out an alert. They couldn't hit alarm. Everyone come up. And don't forget, this is an unsinkable ship. So it's freezing cold on that deck. Don't worry. It's just an alarm. How many times have we said, don't worry, the building's not on fire. It's just another drill. There was a lot of reluctance. Also, a lot of these people were from the surf class. They didn't actually... They, they didn't move of their own volition. It was culturally built in. A lot of people were seen just sitting on their trunks and waiting for a, a higher up to tell them what to do. Uh, meanwhile, in the first class cabins, they got dressed. Their stewards tied their shoes. And this, by the way, was out of a love and affection. People were very close to their valets and their maids. And you'll see this in the coming hour. Uh, back then, there were no sports stars. That was, that was silliness. It was, it, was a, it was a bar drinker's sport. Um, there were no... Hollywood stars yet. The people who captured the imagination of the world were the aristocrats. These were the folks who everyone wanted to see, which is why they sadly dominated the, co the coverage and a lot of the story of steerage and the real suffering that happened to the children and women down there and the men was not told for a very long time. Now, on the deck, 
there are some terrible examples of depravity. R- men really reached, men and women reached the depths of what they're capable of when, re- when faced with the situation. And other men and women achieved the absolute heights, the most noble and rare characteristics that we can possibly achieve. There's Father Thomas, Bo- uh, F- Father Thomas Biles, who has since, by Pope Pius X, been named a blessed martyr of the church and has been put forth for beatification. He went down over and over again and brought up steerage passengers from down below and guided them through the maze, brought them up, and uh, he himself turned down two lifeboats and then waited, praying to get to, to pray the rosaries, to give final absolution, and to hear confession on that ship as it went down. He gave his life for the souls on that ship. That man was absolutely selfish. There's another man, uh, another woman, Lady Lacey Duff Gordon a very successful wife of uh, Sir Cosmo Duff Gordon. She's a great example. She refused to get into a boat without her husband. They found multiple boats that would take her and her maid, and she wouldn't leave him. And finally, in the third try, they got in a boat, and they were able to escape. Her husband did not perform so admirably. He famously bribed, or while was accused of having bribed the sailors to not return into the pitch-black darkness to pick up the survivors who had only minutes to live before cardiac arrest for fear that the boat, which was far under capacity, would be swamped. These are not the nobler things in life. But then there are others. There is Lucian Smith, whose whose wife was Eloise. They were newlyweds. They were returning from from their honeymoon to the United States. He put her in the boat and said, do not worry. I will be right behind you. Go, Lottie, for God's sake, you have to go. I'll get a seat in another boat, Harvey called to, uh, Collier told his wife, Charlotte. Harvey and his wife had sold their grocery store in England. They were buying a fruit farm in Idaho. They were going to start a new life. Benjamin Guggenheim told his wife, uh, his, excuse me, his French mistress, her maid and her servant, that he couldn't go with them because... Second mate, uh, second, mate, second officer, Captain Lighthaller, wouldn't let any men. He misinterpreted the orders. He was a firm and a good and courageous Englishman, but he misinterpreted women first as no men allowed. He wouldn't let Mr. Guggenheim go on board with his wife and with the maids and the servants, even though she was ill and sickly. He said, that's fine. It's just a light repair. I'll see you tomorrow. It's just we will be on our way before you know it. Lieutenant Colonel Jacob Astor did the exact same thing. He boarded his family, and he said, just go on without you. I'll see you tomorrow. Now, at this point, every one of these men knew that was a lie. They were not getting off. Guggenheim, when he got off his valet, took off his life jacket, removed his sweater, and got on his Sunday best and said, I am prepared to die like a gentleman. He gave a steward who later escaped the final message to his wife in New York saying, just know that I did my duty. Wallace Hartley led the band. There were two different bands there. He was in charge of brunch music and also Sunday music. I think some after dinner music. They'd never played together, but the captain said, you two, you gentlemen, get together and keep calm. They played happy music, waltzes, and they stayed till the end and they played until their instruments could no longer stand up on the deck. When they finally went down and all these souls were lost, very few people survived on the deck. They made those decisions. They were either left behind and they were stranded, or they made a decision, whether it was to, like Colonel Jacob Astor, who lit a cigarette with a French author and sat there and said, okay, here it comes. Some of the men survived that plunge into the sea. Lighthaller, Gracie, a few others made it. They managed to find a capsized boat, and they got to it through that 28-degree water. It doesn't kill you with hypothermia. It kills you with cardiac arrest and suffocation. That is how you die in that water. It is very cold. They got aboard this capsized boat and were balancing it by standing on it in the pitch black. The lights had gone out and the ship was gone. One man came and tried to get on board, but one more person on that ship would tip them. They said, God, go, go with you, man. There's no more people who can fit on this boat or you'll tip us. He cried back in a loud, strong voice, good luck and God bless you. All right, boys. This is the peak. And by the way, these men weren't all perfect men. Some of them made bad decisions. Some of them made good decisions. Some of them chose cowardice, and some of them chose bravery. These are not immutable characteristics that you can't change. They are choices. Somebody is not a coward or a brave person. There is no Slytherin or Gryffindor. These are decisions that you make 
to give yourself, to do what is right. And, and we hopefully will never have to face decisions quite like that. But some of us, unfortunately, will have to face those decisions. We'll have to tell our future widows or our husbands who we're losing, that's okay, you're not abandoning me. Other women and children need to take your spot. I'm not abandoned, you're doing your duty. There's bravery on both sides of this, and they had to make that call, and they stood by it. Other people didn't. And the actions that took place on that deck, in those boats and in that water for those hours when they waited uh, for rescue later that day, April 15th, 1912, those still reach out to us today. So take those decisions and realize it's a choice, not a characteristic. You can be courageous or you can be a coward, and it's not going to be the same every day. Most often it'll be small decisions, but sometimes you will be tested uh, here or now. And remember what they did. Take it with you, wrap it with you like an armor. And God bless you and God bless the souls of the RMS Titanic.